Today we're going to discuss the doctrine of illumination, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit where he is going to enlighten believers, enabling them to understand the Word of God. Two key words there, enlighten and understand. Now, the Holy Spirit is not going to drop new truth into the person's heart. We're not saying that God couldn't do that, but the primary method of God is that we would read the Bible and he would guide us in that process by uncovering what is already there. All right, let's do a little test. Right now you're in the dark. What am I holding in my hand? You don't know, you can't see it, it's too dark. Now, you're here, I'm here, the object is here, it's always been here, but you don't know what it is until we turn on the light. Now you can see that it's, it's just a mouse, right? This is the way the Holy Spirit is doing things for the body of Christ, enabling us to understand the scriptures by uncovering the truth that's already there called enlightenment. Now there are three main reasons why this is a necessary function of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The first one is this, we cannot know God's thoughts without him revealing them to us. Second, we cannot make sense of what we should understand without God helping us. And third, we cannot know what God intends on our own because we are inclined to our own sinful passions. We're gonna unpack all three of those. So the first one, why do we need enlightening? God is spirit, he is infinite, and we are unable to know him because he's unable to be calculated. We can't pick him up anywhere, right? We can't detect God and so God must reveal himself to us. Hence, we have our Bible. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 through 12 on our first point, which is we cannot know God's thoughts without him revealing them to us. Paul the Apostle says this, But as it is written, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For... Who knows the person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So let's look at this for a second. All that God has prepared for his people, his children, in the New Testament time in Jesus Christ, were hidden and unknown, but now they've been revealed to us by the Spirit of God in the form of the words of the New Testament in the mouth of the apostles. That's recorded for us. That also gives us what the Old Testament actually meant. So now we know where the Old Testament is going. But just like he says this, he says in verse 11, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? You don't know what I'm thinking unless I tell you. And I don't know what you're thinking unless you tell me. And for me to guess, I might get it right, but I might get it wrong, and I probably will. It's the same thing with God, unless God reveals what he's thinking, what he intends in his word, we're not going to land on the right conclusion all on our own, even though we're reading those words. Now, the good news is we got the spirit of God so that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we understand those things by reading the word of God and him helping us to comprehend what's there, what those hidden things are. We can't get in on our own. We need God to help us. Now, that might sound like the Holy Spirit is going to drop this truth in our head because he's going to reveal it to us. That's not what he's saying here. We're commanded over and over to study the word of God, to know what God's truth is, and to work through it. This then does not excuse us from the hard work of interpretation of the Bible. You and I have to read, okay? Um, let's look at it like this. The better you know Genesis, the better you're going to know the book of Exodus, because Exodus is the flowering from the seeds that happened and were planted in Genesis. The better you know your Old Testament, the better you're going to understand your New Testament. And the better you know the Gospels, the better you're going to know the epistles. So you think about the book of Revelation, and you see the garden in Revelation with the tree of life and God with his people in Revelation. Where does that come from? Well, it's Genesis chapter 1 restored after it was lost 
in chapter 3 by Adam and Eve sinning and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the Holy Spirit doesn't work on you after this process, but he works on you through this process. And that's a very important key piece of this whole discussion. Now, the second one we're going to talk about is we cannot make sense of what we should walk away with without God helping us to understand. Let's think about it like this. You spend your whole life reading the book of Proverbs and you get really good and familiar. Maybe you memorize all 31 chapters of Proverbs. You get a really good idea of, of how to live out God's mandate. But is that the end goal of God's revelation, that you should master the book of Proverbs and just live out that? Well, if you understand more of the Bible, then you will know that Deuteronomy are the commands of God to Israel on how he wants them to live. Proverbs is how you live out those commands. It's the everyday life that believers must go through, specifically in the Old Testament, but there are principles for us anew as well. But this is how Deuteronomy is worked out. Now, Deuteronomy, in other words, Proverbs sends you back to Deuteronomy to learn more. And once you read Deuteronomy, you see it's not just law code. It's not just do this and don't do that. In Deuteronomy 18, for example, God has Moses telling the people, listen, God is going to raise up a prophet like myself, and you guys need to listen to him or you will be cut off from the people. Of course, that's talking about Jesus who will come in the New Testament time. So to properly understand Proverbs, you need to know where it flows out of, which is Deuteronomy. And when you look at Deuteronomy, you don't merely land in Proverbs. You go beyond Proverbs as you live out Proverbs, waiting for the Messiah in the New Testament and you land at Jesus if you properly understand Deuteronomy, okay? Now, let's look at Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things from out of your law. Now, the psalmist, whoever wrote this, maybe it was David, maybe not, he says many things in here. And it's important to recognize that he uplifts God, he uplifts God's law, God's word, and he confesses his own sin and his own helplessness. And so to isolate any one of these texts inside Psalm 119 is to miss the point of that text. You've got to read it in context. So let's break this down. Open my eyes. That's a request. God, please open my eyes. Now think about that. What is that a request for? Open my eyes. But what is it also in addition to a request. What does it reveal about the psalmist who's saying this? It reveals that he's in need. He can't open his own eyes. It's a confession of his inadequacy. Open my eyes that I may behold. I can't see it on my own. I lack the ability. I need your help, God. That I may behold wondrous things from out of your law. Now, the law of God, you know, is do this and don't do that, specifically in the Old Testament period. That's what we'd be talking about here for the person who wrote this psalm. The law is really extended to all of the word of God, not merely the law code itself. By the time of the psalms, this is what was understood. And he wants to see wondrous things. So this is an interesting point. He's saying that when I read the word of God, it's going to be flat. I'm going to see, do this, don't do that. God created this and this and this and that and that happened. And here, here's who said this and they did that and all of that. And maybe the story holds interest. Maybe it gets monotonous or boring. He's saying, open my eyes that I may see the wondrous things that are there. I don't know what to look for, God. I don't know how to make sense of it all. I don't know how to see beyond what's there. Let me give you a little example. If you read the law of God, you might come to a flat interpretation where God says, do this and don't do this. But when you understand how God created the human, that we need boundaries, right? When God made Adam and Eve, his wisdom is present. He made the earth so that there was land and there was sea, water. He could have left it the way it was in the beginning, all covered with water. In the moment he creates Adam, what does Adam do? He drowns. So God in his wisdom said, let me divide things up. So in other words, a proper understanding of God's word and a deeper look into those wonders, the Holy Spirit will help us see God doesn't create Adam until after he has prepared the earth. Adam has to have a place that's 
hospitable to him. He's got to have, if he doesn't have land, he's got to have a boat. And God didn't make a boat. He made land and water separated so Adam could survive. So we see the goodness of God there. Now, number three, we cannot know what God intends on our own because we are inclined to our own sinful passions. Very interesting concept. I want you to think of uh, this psalm here, 119 verses 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I want you to, to really hear what he's saying. I'm going to start with verse 11. He says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, you and I also as Christians know God's word. We know what he said. And we have it in our heart. We have it in our mind. Why do we sin anyway? Why do we cut corners when we ought to do our very best for God? And all of us Christians at times stumble at this, and we know this truth that we shouldn't disobey, and yet we do, while we have the word in our heart. So apparently, it's not as easy as it's being stated here in verse 11. The Bible's not contradicting. We just got to gotta read the whole picture here. So I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can a man, verse 9, keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. That's true, but verse 10 tells us the whole story. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Wait a minute. I thought we just have to have God's word in our heart. He's saying, even when I seek you with the best of my ability, there's still something wrong, God. I need you to help me not to wander from your commandments because I keep wandering. Whenever you and I read truth, especially our Bible, we have a tendency to see it the way we want to see it based on our own sinful leanings, right? We want to disturb our peace as little as possible. We avoid conviction. So we're going to water down naturally what we read and what we see we want the excitement of God's word, but we don't want the conviction. We don't want the work that it might lead us to do, the, the hard work of self-evaluation or changing our behavior in our life. So we're going to read the Bible in a particular fashion that is not as helpful to us as God needs it to be. The Holy Spirit in enlightenment, he's going to help us through illumination to apply that word to our hearts. We're not going to be able to escape when the Holy Spirit is illuminating the text to us. We're going to see ourselves in light of that. Remember this also, that the application process where the Holy Spirit is helping us to really see what's there and allow our hearts to be convicted in our present state, whether that's sinful or not, so that we can actually change. When he does this, it's not stuck in the pages of the Bible. Um, it's not in your quiet time alone with Jesus when you're reading and discovering this truth, although that's part of it. What I really mean to say is it doesn't end there at all. The Holy Spirit goes with you in your day, and this extends to your whole life, not just when you read the Bible and learn this truth, but after you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is still applying this truth. This illuminating process is Him helping you see in your everyday life that you need this, and here's where it applies. And then you won't forget the lesson because not only did you read it and discover it in the Word of God, but you're seeing the Holy Spirit work with you every day through this process. The purpose of the Holy Spirit illuminating our hearts with the Word of God is also to make sure that we understand the Bible's testimony about Jesus. Jesus is to be learned about. Jesus is to be obeyed and Jesus is to be proclaimed. So if your heart is being enlightened by the Spirit of God as you read the Word of God, Jesus is going to shine through the pages, and you're going to come into a deeper relationship with Him. You're going to love Him more. You're going to cry more because you're going to realize your sin more. So these are just a few points here to help us understand the power of the illumination of the Holy Spirit as we read the Word of God and interpret it, Him working with us so that we land at the right interpretation, we apply it correctly to our lives, and we actually live out transformation every day, glorifying God 
in Jesus Christ.